Good afternoon, and welcome to a Kalamazoo Junior Symphony Orchestra concert unlike any other in our 82 years. I'm Andrew Kohler, music director, and I'm dressed in a tux in my living room. What a world. Late last summer, the board of the KJSO voted to keep our fall concert cycle fully virtual. And so the organization staff immediately got to work thinking about how to translate an orchestral experience into the online sphere. We concentrated on efforts into taking two short works, originally scheduled in the program intended to be performed last spring when the pandemic started, and recording them separately to a template track and then layering them together, thanks to the technological wizardry of our operations director, Dave Kreider. We're excited to share the result of those efforts with you this afternoon. Now, it goes without saying that we all dearly miss the opportunity to be in the same space together and to feel the shared energy of our physical presence and sound. But as we've gone through the project, I've been grateful to recognize the silver linings of our online concert cycle. More time to understand the context and the history of the works we're playing. An opportunity for each member to listen to and reflect on their own individual recorded performance and more direct interaction with our many gifted section coaches. But don't just take it from me. Here's what some of our students thought about the challenges and opportunities of this virtual experience. You know, you get to take six on whatever segment and then you just start making silly mistakes and just finding what you are comfortable with sending in and what you're not, what mistakes you're okay with, because it's not just a one and done and, oh, I can't accept whatever I sent in at that point. <laughs> hey, so um, I think the most challenging part of recording was like going back and listening to isolated recordings of myself playing and just kind of analyzing every little flaw and detail. I thought the greatest challenge of this project was trying to get a sound that best matches my in-person playing through a video recording. The most challenging part was any little background noise when I was play or when I wasn't playing in a section would become very obvious in the recording and then I'd have to restart. Uh, I thought the hardest part about the recording process was the fact that I can't always hear my section because playing along with the recording is sort of like standing in the audience and playing with a live orchestra. It was harder to see the big picture with the recording because I'm accustomed to being surrounded by other people playing their instruments. I feel like one of the biggest challenges for me was finding the purpose of um, producing a satisfying recording. Um, I feel like if we were in person, one of the biggest motivators for me would be the final concert. Uh, where we really show our passion about the music and uh, effectively communicate the message the composer or uh, we interpreted the music as. I learned that an in-person orchestra and a, a virtual orchestra is completely different. Like I thought it would be, I would be easier virtually, but I was totally wrong. Something that I learned through this recording process was how to better practice with a recording. What I learned is to keep pace with the music accurately, without a conductor. I learned a lot of things from it, mostly being timing. I had to learn how precise you had to be with a template, because just one timing error, you could be entirely thrown off. And I was able to really hear how um, a full symphony kind of play their music with the dynamics and shaping. So I was able to kind of mimic that as I was playing. I learned a lot about intonation, staying, keeping in tune on a long, sustained note. That's something I always try to work on, and it's helped me a lot doing this recording process. I felt I gained better orchestral listening skills through the recording process. My timing and intonation improved drastically from the first version, simply because I was able to listen to and play along with the template recording better. Through the recording process, I learned time management and that technology is not as reliable, especially when you're not familiar with the programs you're using or the ways you're uploading things. I guess the most important thing that I've learned is just that uh, nothing will be perfect. Um, there's always going to be imperfections in what you do, um, but it's important to get closer and closer to perfection. I 
I really enjoyed being able to virtually play along with an orchestra again. I haven't done it since March and I really missed it. What I liked about recording at home was when I make mistakes, I can just re-record as many times as I want to. One of the most rewarding parts of the recording process was becoming more comfortable with listening back to and critiquing myself. One thing that I found really rewarding was that I prepared a lot more for this because obviously it's more stressful when it's just you inside a recording and when you're listening back on it, it's only your part so you can hear, you know, like your really tiny mistakes. The most rewarding thing about the recording process was the end product, the last video you made or the one that you submitted because that's the one you've practiced for and that's the one you've recorded over and over again and you finally get to listen to it and you fix all those mistakes. What I found most rewarding about the recording process was the fact that we were still able to have a performance. Even though this is not the setting that we would usually expect or prefer, we were still able to find a way around the obstacles that we had to face and together we were able to create a wonderful performance. Even though there's troubles that come our way and it seems like it's impossible for us to achieve the goals that we were aiming for, we can still find different ways of doing them and even learn through the process. Both works we are performing today come from a program titled In Russia's Shadow. The first, Ukrainian composer Mykola Lesenko's overture to the opera Taras Bulba might be unknown to many, while the second work, Jan Sibelius' Finlandia, is a justly beloved standard of the orchestra repertory. Both composers lived and wrote their pieces in a time when their native lands for which they had intensely patriotic feelings, were under the often oppressive rule of Russia. Now, we'll start today with the Lysenko. Lysenko was part of a suppressed late 19th century movement to assert Ukrainian cultural consciousness. He collected Ukrainian folk music, he noted its unique contours, he even proudly wrote about this in the Ukrainian language, which Russian authorities officially banned in public works. His opera, Taras Bulba, was based on a novella by fellow Ukrainian Mykola Hohol, whom many may know by his Russified name, Nikolai Gogol. Taras is a fierce Ukrainian Cossack or independent warrior fighting to repel the various encroaching empires and maintain sovereignty. Though Hohol, or Gogol, wrote his story in Russian, Lysenko set his opera in Ukrainian and changed the story to make it more overtly nationalistic. An early admirer of the piano score was none other than Pyotr Tchaikovsky, who also had Ukrainian heritage, and he wanted to take the work to Moscow to be performed at the Bolshoi Theater. But such an opportunity came with the precondition that it be translated into Russian, of course, and Lysenko, ever the patriot, refused, and consequently, given the censoring of Ukrainian language, he never had a chance to hear his opera performed. It was even lost for many years. And that's really too bad, because as you'll soon hear, Lysenko is a composer of bravura energy and extraordinary melodic gifts. And in this particular overture, he even manages to work in a beloved Ukrainian folk tune, Saskistala Kozuchenke, which translates to The Cossacks Whistled. And this brings the work to its thrilling close. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now we'll take an intermission of sorts to hear about a beloved annual fundraising tradition of the KJSO, the fruit sale, and also to get a behind the scenes look at how exactly our multi-talented operations director, Dave Kreider, went well above and beyond the call of duty to create this individually recorded video you've been watching. For over 50 years, the KJSO has been raising money to support great educational experiences for our students through the fruit sale. The KJSO's sale is 100% online, making it 100% COVID safe. You can send fruit as a gift to anywhere in the U.S. or use our touchless pickup service at Waddell's Garden Center on 12th Street in early December. Between now and November 29, Go to KJSO.org, click the fruit sale link, and order fruit for your family and friends. Thanks for supporting the KJSO. Now for a look behind the scenes of this virtual concert presentation. My name is Dave Kreider, and I had the privilege of creating this video for the talented and dedicated students of the KJSO. The process began with creating reference recordings that our students could listen and play along to while recording their individual part. The reference recordings provided a guide for tempo and tuning. Once the reference recordings were created, our students began studying them and practicing recording themselves using their smartphones or other digital cameras. Once recorded, the videos were uploaded so our instructors could give feedback to each student. As you can see, there are close to 500 audio files in this project, and each one needed to be time-aligned and balanced. Each recording is organized and grouped by instrument and can be adjusted individually or as a group. Editing the video is a similar process, and with this many videos, it was no small task. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of the show. In contrast to Lysenkos Taras Bulba, Sibelius' Finlandia is a well-known and frequently played work. It's surely no coincidence that Finland's bid for freedom was achieved just a few decades after this piece was written, while Ukraine's would have to wait until the dissolution of the Soviet Empire. But at the time of Finlandia's writing in 1900, much of Finland was indeed under the thumb of the Russian Empire. As Finnish nationalist sentiment bubbled up, the Russian Tsar issued a number of decrees aimed at tamping down dissent, including a restriction of press freedoms. Finlandia was part of the resistance to those decrees, but needed to be performed with false titles to evade any imperial interference. And so what was sometimes known simply as impromptu, but which many savvy Finns knew immediately was a celebration of Finnish nationalism, came eventually to be known properly as Finlandia and it cemented Sibelius as Finland's greatest composer. The narrative arc of the work couldn't be clearer. The oppressive brass of the opening clearly referenced the yoke of Russia. There's an upbeat militaristic resistance that follows, and then finally a hymn so stirring that Finns gave it words and still sing it today as an unofficial second national anthem. Enjoy.
this brings us to the close of our first ever all virtual concert. Hours and hours of work from student practice to the careful listening and feedback of our section coaches to the extraordinary effort of editing and mixing some 60 individual tracks by our technical director, Dave Kreider, all poured into these few minutes of music. I hope you've enjoyed the fruits of our labors, but more than anything, I hope that we will again be able to gather in person and make music again soon, and that we'll be able to welcome you into Genre Auditorium to share that music. Accompanying the end credits you're about to see is a reminder of the live concert experience, a beacon of hope for its return. It's a small extract from our last performance in Genre of the Schumann Rhenish Symphony. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon, and be well, everyone.